problem. And I was saying that uh, people today, especially in light of the corona crisis, are, there's a surge of interest of the end times, Bible prophecy. And that is, that is not unusual. It usually happens when there's a calamity or a tragedy with this magnitude. A time of crisis is a great time of uncertainty. And so people don't know what's going to happen. People are worried about their own future and the future of their families, the future of their livelihood and jobs, whether they will still have a job next week. And they want answers and clarity and assurances. And they would seek for these wherever they can find them. And so uh, psychics and fortune tellers are cashing in on people's anxiety. But these fortune tellers don't really know the future. They're just guessing. Because if they do, then they would be one of the richest people on earth. And they would have to make a living as psychics. What these people actually say to their clients is give them a future that is more or likely going to happen or what the people wants to hear. There's only one person who knows the future, and that's God. He alone knows the beginning or the end from the beginning. And the best place for you to know your future is not the horoscope. It's the Bible. A third of the entire Bible is about the future. Because God wants you to know the future in the present. God does not want us to be ignorant about his plans for the future. And that is why the, a significant portion of the Bible is about prophecy. This very important knowledge will give you and I the right motivation for right living and hope in a time of great crisis. That's why God wants us to know the future. And it is about prophecy. Most of, or a huge part of the Bible is about prophecy. And it's not a guesswork. It is an accurate forecast of the future. Now, today's message, we are in today's message, we're going to look at uh, one chapter or a chapter of a, a book from one of the prophetic books in, of the Bible, and that is the book of Daniel. Now, Daniel is one of the most important books that we need to understand if we want to know about the last days and Bible prophecy. And the, the, the book of Daniel connects the prophecies of the Old Testament to the prophecies of the New Testament. In fact, we cannot thoroughly understand the book of Revelation if we don't have a thorough understanding of the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, God records the time, the exact date, month, and year of the Lord's death on the cross. And it talks also about the great tribulation that occurs after the rapture of the church. It talks about the Antichrist who will rule a one world government and the events preceding to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, if you, are a new, if you are new to the Bible, don't be overwhelmed by these terminologies that may seem to be hard to comprehend. Now, the study of the last days is not actually something of a mystery. The Bible is not an obscure thing. It is something to be understood. Now, there are puzzling passages in the Bible but if we use the right tool of interpretation, the right method of interpretation, then these mysteries can be resolved and understood. The real reason why there is a lack of knowledge about the future amongst Christians is not because the Bible has a lot of mysteries. It's because Christians don't spend sufficient time in studying and carefully studying the Bible. In other words, our lack of knowledge about the future 
is by choice. Now, hopefully we're going to do something about that because we're going to talk about the future in our study. In the book of Daniel, we are going to focus our study on chapter 2. Now, the great subject of this chapter is about the four world empires. One, the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. They ruled and will rule world history from the time Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians until the time of the return of Jesus Christ in the millennium or the 100 year reign, 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ. That long period is called the times of the Gentiles. Luke 21 verse 40 mentioned this uh, or 24, mention this term. Now, Daniel, the author of the book, was from Jerusalem. But when Nebuchadnezzar first sieged, uh, captured the city, Daniel was deported or exiled to the city of Babylon, together with other young people. Now, Daniel's name in Hebrew means, God is my judge. But the Babylonians changed, gave him a name that is associated with one of their gods, just like they did with three of Daniel's friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so the purpose for this is for this Hebrew young, young man to forget the God of Israel and be conformed to the gods and the ways of Babylon. And so Hananiah was given the name Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego, and Daniel was given the name Belteshazzar, which means Bel, a god of the Babylonian, Bel protects the king. Now at this point in chapter 2, Daniel was already three years in Babylon. Because he showed himself as an intelligent and a wise young man, he was trained to serve in the court of Nebuchadnezzar as one of the wise men of Babylon that the king would sometimes call on for advice. Now, Daniel chapter 2 is a mix of history and prophecy. So, history from our point of view, prophecy from the point of view of Daniel. And so, what God revealed to Daniel in this section is the future in the present. Now, I've divided our study into three sections so that we can follow the progress of the story and pick up some lessons along the way. The first section is the times ahead of time. Now, the times ahead of time. Now, the future that Daniel wrote about this section was given first to King Nebuchadnezzar in the form of a dream. Verse 1. This is where the story starts. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar played a great role in the history of Israel and of the world. And that is why the Bible mentions his name at least 94 times and is mentioned in many prophecies in the book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And here in Daniel, God gave him a future view of world history in a dream. Now, this is not unusual for God to show the things that are to come to someone who is not even a believer of God in a dream, through a dream. Because God is sovereign over all people, whether they are believers or not. Now, God showed himself or spoke to a tribal, a Philistine tribal chief called Abimelech in Genesis chapter 20 in a dream. He also spoke to Pharaoh of Egypt in a dream and showed him about the severe seven-year famine in Egypt. And he also spoke, God also spoke to a soldier in the Midianite army about Gideon's conquest over their, their army 
also in a dream. So here in Daniel chapter 2, the Lord was speaking to King Nebuchadnezzar about the events and times ahead of time. Verse 1 says that Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, plural, meaning it may have been recurring dreams. He may have dreamed one dream repeatedly until he could not sleep. He had problems sleeping. In fact, that dream terrified him. Verses 27 to 29, if we jump to that, it will tell us why he was troubled by this dream. Verse 27 of the same chapter. Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. So it's in the future. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you're lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come. And the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. Nebuchadnezzar did not fully understand what his dream meant, but he knew it was about the future. And it led him to think, to worry about his own future and about his kingdom. As someone said, an easy lies, an easy lies the head that wears the crown. The common man can have, can sleep like a lamb or like a baby. But the man upstairs, the man on top, finds no rest. The person who has more power and more authority also has more responsibilities. Therefore, suffers more anxiety, stress, fear, and worry. I don't think he would want to be in the shoes of heads of state like our premier today or presidents of countries that have been affected by the pandemic. I don't think you would want to be in their shoes in the midst of this problematic pandemic. I'm sure many of them or some of them probably wish that they were not the boss at this time so that they can walk away from all the problems and all the pressures and all the criticisms. High rank does not guarantee peace. Power, wealth, acclaim does not cause calmness to the troubled heart apart from God. Now people strive to have power and well, thinking that if they have it, it will brought stability and confidence in their lives, but they are sadly mistaken. The pandemic proved them, proved that they're mistaken. Nebuchadnezzar, with all his wealth and power, knew that he was not in control of the future. And that is why he was troubled. He couldn't sleep. He wanted answers. He wanted assurances. He wanted certainty in his uncertainty. And so he called on all his fortune tellers and psychics and spiritual advisors. Verse 2. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. They were all gathered in the court of Nebuchadnezzar and one historian said that it was a scary place because Nebuchadnezzar used to have, used to keep lions in cages beside his throne. And that is to show his power and authority and also to provoke fear to everyone who comes to his court. So it's a scary scene. If you were there, you would be scared. Imagine the scenario. The, the king is on his throne and he's surrounded by guards armed to the teeth and lions in cages growling at you. And so if the king asks you for a question, you better have a good answer. Otherwise, you're in big trouble. Now, let's read on. When they came, meaning the astrologers stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. Tell the servants the dream and we will interpret it. 
The astrologer said, you want your dreams to be interpreted, O king? No worries, mate. Tell us about the dream and we'll give you the interpretation or the meaning of it. If you give, we will give. Now, in this respect, these astrologers are like the modern psychics today. They ask you for some important details of your life, and then they come up with an ambiguous story that can have many meanings, or they choose a future for you that most likely would happen. It's a future that is most likely in line with your current reality. Rose Smith, a, the owner of Absolute Soul Secrets, the largest psychic and spiritual network in the Southern Hemisphere, said her business has seen 25% rise since the beginning of the pandemic. In a newspaper interview, she looked at the coron her coronavirus crystal ball and she predicts that Australians still have a long road ahead of them. That's her prediction. We see that on TV every day. And she said, things will not go back to the way they were, but the virus will end in three years starting from either November 2019 or February 2020, far longer than anticipated. We're already past February. A black shadow, she said, I see in my dreams is an increasing level of complacency worldwide. Some people's hopes are being dashed, so now they have given up on following the guidelines and don't seem to care if others catch the virus and possibly die. But complacency is an evil we have to be ready for, as this pandemic won't end for some time. That's all in the newspapers, and she calls it prediction. When people turn away from the God of Scripture, often they seek out false sources of hope. Remember that if you trust in superstitions, you don't trust in God. You can't have it both ways. If we believe in luck, in horoscopes and fortune telling, then we are diminishing even insulting God. We're saying, God, we don't need you. We don't need you to tell us about anything. We have a better source of information which is more reliable and faithful than you. So if you are a Christian, you should keep away from these things. Now, the astrologers of Nebuchadnezzar wanted to know what the dream of the king was so that they can give him the meaning. Now, that was a sensible request. If you want your dream, the, the meaning of your dream, then you must give us the dream first. That makes sense. The problem was King Nebuchadnezzar wanted them to tell him the dream and the meaning. Verse 5. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turn into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. So the astrologers not only have to provide the interpretation, they also have to recount the dream itself. If they can do both, then they will be greatly rewarded. If not, then their heads will roll, including that of their families. There was no middle ground. This guy, Nebuchadnezzar, was serious. He was not joking. He wanted to know the meaning of his dream that has troubled him. Now, the demands, his demands to the astrologers doesn't mean that he didn't know his dream. He knew his dream. He just didn't know the meaning of it. His demand was actually a test to the ability of these astrologers to genuinely interpret the meaning of his dream. In other words, he was skeptical about their power and ability. 
uh, he suspect that they were fakes. And so he was saying, prove that you're not. If you are truly connected to the supernatural and the divine, then you will have no problem knowing the dream. And therefore, whatever dream you may come up with, or rather interpretation, is the truth. Nebuchadnezzar decided that that's the only way that these astrologers and fortune tellers will not give him any kind of nonsense interpretation whatsoever. He was saying to them, in effect, recall the past in order to give credence or credibility to the prediction, to your prediction of the future. Now, how did the astrologers respond? Verse 7. Once more they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are just trying to gain time. You're just buying time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. It's like the story of the king who gave a sentence, who put a sentence of death to a man. And the man asked for a stay of execution. In return, he said, King, I will teach your horse to fly for about one year. Give me one year and I'll teach your horse to fly. In return, a stay of execution. The king agreed. One man told him, are you crazy? You can't teach the king's horse to fly. And the man said, well, who knows? Maybe within a year the king will die. Or maybe I will die. And who knows, maybe the horse will learn to fly. Nebuchadnezzar sensed that these astrologers were just buying time. They were just stalling, hoping that he may change his mind or the situation may change. But he wouldn't have anything with that. He firmly said, verse 8, If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. How would you feel if you were one of the astrologers? You're standing there, and the king says, do a miracle, or I'll kill you. The astrologers must have said, how can we get out of this terrible situation? They tried one more time, saying... That what the king has asked them was impossible. Verse 10. The astrologers answered the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asked. That's impossible. You got to be crazy in asking us this, O king. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. That means this is unprecedented. What the king asks is too difficult, it's impossible. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods. And they do not live among humans. They said what the king was asking was unprecedented and impossible. No one would ever ask anything like that. Because only the gods can do it. And the gods don't dwell amongst humans. You see, in Babylonian thinking, there is a big separation between the gods who live up there in heaven and the humans who live down here on earth. In other words, their gods were aloof. Their gods didn't concern themselves with the affairs of men and therefore what the king was asking can never be done. They can never give it. And so when the king heard that as a good tyrant, Nebuchadnezzar went berserk. He was really enraged. Verse 12. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, is that your, is that your last answer? And so, you die. Nebuchadnezzar at first, Nebuchadnezzar may had uh, suspicions that they were fake. Now he knows they are. And so he said to himself, these people are useless. Kill them all. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death. And men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends 
to put them to death. The problem was the sentence of death was not just against the few who were there in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, but everyone who were considered as wise men. And Daniel and his friends being trained in that service were included. And so they also had the sentence of death upon their head. And they didn't even knew what was happening. But look at how Daniel responded to one of the most dangerous and critical moments of his life. When Ariok, the commander of the king's guard, he was the executioner, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. Suddenly, out of nowhere, soldiers barged into the rooms, arresting everyone, including Daniel and his friends. But Daniel responded in calmness and wisdom. Well, the others were probably struggling and fighting or arguing with the soldiers. Probably some of them ran away for their lives. Daniel didn't panic. Someone said, when you can keep your head when all around you are losing theirs, you have not fully grasped the severity of the situation. Well, Daniel fully understood the severity of the situation, but he kept his head. He didn't panic. He simply and calmly and tactfully asked some explanation. How can he be so calm and cool in the face of sure death? How can he have has that? How can he behave like that when his life was on the line? It was his faith in God that gave him the supernatural serenity in his heart in the face of the great test. You see, Daniel was prepared for this kind of emergency because he has all this time deepened and strengthened his spiritual roots so that when the testing came, he stood firm. I want you to look at the next verses. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. In other words, the secret of Daniel's strength in the midst of this life-threatening crisis is his prayer life. Daniel was, al was always a man of the word and a man of prayer. In chapter 6, we see him as praying on his knees three times a day. Praying on his knees three times a day and he does it every day all the time. And here in verse 18, he pleaded with his friends to pray with him. To plead to the God of heaven to help them in their crisis. This is what you and I should be doing in our crisis. Praying individually and corporately together with others because there is power in prayer of agreement. Daniel and his friends understood this. Jesus taught this in Matthew chapter 18. If two of you on earth agree, whatever you ask for, my Father in heaven will do it. Let me ask you a question. What is the best time to prepare for the future? What is the best time to prepare for the future? In the present. The right time to do the right thing is not tomorrow, but today. If you want to prepare for the future, a better future, then you better do something about your future today. For example, if you are single and you want to get married and you want to have a good and happy marriage, then you need to prepare for that marriage before you're married. You need to work on that relationship 
with your prospective spouse now, not after you're married. You need to work on your attitude, on the pride, on your priority, on the giving and the receiving of forgiveness. If we have, if you have problems on these matters before you're married, you're going to have a harder time when you're married. If you're not happy with your relationship now, you will be more unhappy when you're married. Uh, there's a woman who wrote a, a counselor named Abby, and her letter reads, Dear Abby, I am 44 years old, and I would like to meet a man my age with no bad habits. Signed, Rose. The reply came, Dear Rose, so would I. Mm. Hoping for a better future means nothing if you're not doing something about your future today. And that is why if we want to be prepared for tomorrow's unexpected crisis and emergency, we need to be spiritually in shape today. We need to prepare before the next emergency will come. And it will come. We need to train ourselves for the next crisis. Crisis comes like lightning bolt out of the blue. And when the moment of crisis comes, it's too late to start making the preparations. Developing a strong faith in God takes time and individual effort. Be inspired by other people's faith, but it can't be, it can't, their faith can't replace a faith of your own. When you are face, facing a crisis, ultimately, you have to face it yourself. That is why it's up to you to develop a personal relationship with God. If you are not starting, if you haven't started now, do it now. If you don't have a relationship with God, then come to Jesus Christ. If I'm talking to you who is not yet a Christian, come to Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, the only way you can have a relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin, because all of us are sinners, and receive his free gift of salvation. Make him your Lord and Savior, then you have a relationship with God. Now, if you are a Christian, then start building a prayer life. In terms, when it comes to unprecedented crisis, emergencies, calamities. There's nothing like a good relationship with God to strengthen you. And that relationship comes because you build a good prayer life like Daniel. Second, know God's word. Knowing God's word, you'll know the God of the word. In moments of crisis, it's the, your knowledge of God's word that will give you comfort and strength. It's the knowledge of the word of God that gives you the anchor of your faith to give you stability and confidence in the midst of your storm. And it is the source of real hope and real joy even when you are in tears. Now look at the great benefits of having a strong relationship with God. First, God touched the heart of this guy, Ariok, the executioner, to be kind towards Daniel. Verse 14. When Ariok, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Ariok then explained the matter to Daniel. So instead of just brushing away Daniel like, shut up, you ask, don't ask questions. Fall in line and meet your death like a man. Instead of doing that, Ariel sits down and explains to Daniel what happened. So Daniel would be on the know. Second, God moved Nebuchadnezzar to give Daniel an audience and time. Verse 16, at this Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. You can't just go into the king anytime you want. Your head can be chopped off that way. 
And instead, Daniel should have been thrown into prison together with the rest, waiting for execution. He was ushered into the presence of the king. And that's a miracle. And not only that, Nebuchadnezzar gave him time to interpret the dream. You remember the, as the astrologers asked for, for Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the Nebuchadnezzar time to interpret? Nebuchadnezzar denied that. But when Daniel asked for it, he did it. That's the hand of God. And last, God revealed the mystery of the king's dream to Daniel. Verse 19, during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. The astrologers of Nebuchadnezzar had a problem. The only way that they can know the dream of Nebuchadnezzar is if they had contact with the one who gave the dream in the first place. But they knew they had none. They had no contact with the real God. That is why they were hopelessly lost, but not Daniel. Daniel had a beautiful relationship with the one who gave the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. And that is why Daniel was so confident. To the king he said, give me time. I pray and inquire of the Lord. And I am sure he is going to give me the meaning of the dream he gave you. And God surely did. Daniel rejoiced. Because God came through for him at the most critical and dangerous moment of his life. And some of us can understand what that means. Because we ourselves have experienced God's grace, his faithfulness, his love, his power in our lives. Daniel, in gratitude for everything that God has done for him, burst into a hymn of praise. And gave God all the glory. Verse 19. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. In these words, David was saying, it's God alone who can reveal the times and seasons that affect the destiny of humankind. It's God alone who controls the course of world events. It's God alone who has the power to uncover the things that are concealed. It's God alone who is the source of true wisdom and it's God alone who knows what the future will bring. God knows the future. He controls the future. Therefore, you can trust God with your future. We'll end here. Next Sunday, we'll talk about the dark times ahead. Join me in a word of prayer. Lord, you are the God who knows all things. You are the God who is in control of our future, even the world. You are in control of this situation in a seemingly chaotic, problematic, terrible condition that we are in today. We trust.